Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I want to begin, I guess, with an acknowledgement that the perspective of this presentation um, and of Troubled Island, the opera, uh, is basically from an African-American attempt to sort of establish a diaspora and look to the legacy of autonomy in Haiti. Uh, 20th century um, American ideas of Haitian stories could be a little problematic in themselves, but they were also a really real part of Black American consciousness. Um, and like Michael said, I'm working here primarily with the James Weldon Johnson papers and the Langston Hughes papers. So I want to begin here with a little bit of background about this opera. Um, so what we're looking at here right now is a cartoon that was run by the New York Times in 1939. This is on the eve of the world premiere of Troubled Island, um, which was a project that was actually begun all the way back in the mid-1930s. So it was over a decade in the making. Uh, the, pro the libretto was written by Langston Hughes. Uh, the music was scored by William Grant Still. Um, the libretto was also worked on by Berna Arby, who is Still's wife. Um, and yeah, this was Still's first opera. It was really one of the first black produced operas in the US. Um, and it was covering the story of Dessaline, uh, who is one of the principal actors of the Haitian Revolution sort of covers his rise and his fall and his possible betrayal of or by his race and people. Um, it was designed as a black story, but clearly we can see here in this cartoon, it wasn't completely executed this way. This is a very interracial, I guess, cast and crew that we can see here. Um, and that is something that we will come back to in a minute. So, this was by no means the only idea of Haiti in this American theatrical imagination. Um, Haiti had been occupied by the US uh, right after World War I up until the 1930s. And so in a way we can think of that as sort of an opening for Americans to explore, um, to become tourists in Haiti as well. And of course for African-Americans, uh, Haiti had long existed as an ideal of black autonomy. This, Black Republic, um, which was very important since the 19th century to a lot of Black Americans. So right now we're looking at uh, another opera about Haiti that actually was produced in the same year, 1949. This is Wanga uh, by John S. Mateus and uh, Clarence Cameron White. Um, and so I think this is an example of this sort of wave of productions that centered Haiti. Uh, primarily were produced by or with African-Americans. Um, and so uh, Mathieu and White actually went to Haiti for a couple of weeks in 1928 um, to do some research. And yet we can see here, um, this portion that I've highlighted here, the curtain rises and falls. Um, there's this emphasis on primitive, dark, uh, barbaric expressions of jungle rituals. So we can see that even for African-Americans, um, this was sort of a complicated relationship with Haiti uh, that was sort of imbued by these ideas of American civilization. Um, and so that's something that I think really speaks to a lot of the issues that sometimes pervaded um, American ideas of Haiti, even in these theatrical imaginings. Uh, so Wanga was one of the main productions uh, really, when we think about um, productions that centered Haiti in the early uh, 20th century, we tend to think about another production, uh, which is sadly not in the Beinecke archives, but I think it's really interesting, and that is Orson Welles' uh, Voodoo Macbeth, which was the popular title for it. Um, I think it's worth mentioning because a lot of productions really harkened back to that 1936 production, which was produced um, by, the, by the WPA, um, by the Negro unit, actually. Um, and it's important to note as well that Wells, who produced the, the, the Macbeth, um, he was not Black. And so he produced that play um, when he was very young, I believe in his 20s. Um, and it's sort of interesting to note that for both Wanga and Troubled Island, uh, the Black showrunners had tried to get their productions through for over a decade. Um, and so there is sort of like a racial situation there as well. Um, 
And I think also I wanted to point this out. Uh, this is a reference to Wanga that comes up in a letter from Phil to Hughes. Um, they seem to all be good friends. Uh, there is a note that, you know, White's opera about Haiti was going to come out soon. And so we can think maybe this was a little bit of a friendly competition about who could get their, uh, their opera out into the, the world first. So now I want to look a little bit more into Troubled Island specifically. This is a playbill from 1937 um, for Drums of Haiti, which is one of the first iterations of Troubled Island, I guess. This was written by Langston Hughes um, and it was a play. Uh, it was not an opera yet. Um, Drums of Haiti eventually would become Emperor of Haiti, which is the initial image that we started this presentation off with. Um, but Drums of Haiti, we can see here, um, it is explicitly referencing Macbeth, the most colorful and exciting spectacle since Macbeth, that would be Orson Welles' Macbeth of the year before. Um, and it's also referencing this idea of authenticity. So we have authentic voodoo rituals and African dances. And I think a big part of that authenticity is that when we look at this playbill, we can see clearly a photograph with the actors, um, with black actors specifically. Uh, these are the Roxanne players um, who were a troupe that was run by Elsie Boxborough in Detroit. Um, and so that is something we will come back to, the idea of Black actors being a central uh, aspect of Haitian theatrical productions or not, as it turns out. And so this here is a 1949 article that Hughes wrote. And it's really just sort of outlining um, the way that Drums of Haiti eventually transitions into Troubled Island. Um, I think that something that's really interesting here, we know that um, we know that Phil approached Hughes around 1936 about the prospect of creating an opera together. Um, and Hughes had offered uh, Drums of Haiti or Emperor of Haiti by then as a potential storyline. Um, and it's also really interesting to know just how many works uh, that he was, had produced about Haiti. We can see here uh, that his grand uncle, John Mercer Langston was one of the first American ambassadors to Haiti. And so this is really a legacy that Hughes felt he could lay claim to from his childhood. Um, I think also it's interesting that we can see here um, in this sort of fourth paragraph um, that Hughes actually took some prize money in 1930 and went to Haiti for six months. Uh, this is his sort of big research trip. Um, and really it forms the basis for a number of other projects um, besides Drums of Haiti, Emperor of Haiti and Troubled Island. Uh, so for example, this is Popo and Fafina, uh, which Hughes wrote with his good friend, Arno Bontem. Um, this is digitized in the archives. I think it's really cute. It's essentially a children's story um, that Hughes wrote about Haiti. Um, and so we can see here that he really looked to Haiti as this educational project um, about diaspora in general. Uh, this book came out in 1932. Um, and so in a way it predates a lot of his sort of uh, more extended um, projects about Haiti as well. All right, so at this point, we're gonna bring in some of our other key players um, for Troubled Island. We have here on the right, William Grant Stills. This is a pretty great portrait, I think, that I believe was taken by Carl Van Becken. Um, and over here on the left, this is a piece of ephemera about Berna Arby, who eventually will become Stills' wife. Um, both of these two were musicians. They were both really, really interested in promoting um, Black culture and Black arts. Uh, we can also see in this program from one of Arvi's concerts uh, that she's very interested in globalism and this sort of musical ethnography. Um, and the regions that she's chosen to highlight in this program have a, a pretty high um, rate of Black diaspora there as well. Um, so that's something interesting to note. She does also have a piece that is representing Haiti here. Eventually, RV is going to finish the libretto for Hughes, 
um, because if anyone who has read Hughes's papers knows, he gets very easily sidetracked. He has a very busy uh, professional and social calendar. Um, and so RB eventually does finish this libretto. We can see in the letter on the left um, enclosed is the end of act two, scene one that you were working on and now I've completed. Uh, you'll notice that it's changed. Uh, she was pretty central, I think, to a lot of this creative process. Um, and when we look through her letters with Hughes, we can see that they were reasonably close. A lot of these are handwritten letters, um, which is interesting because Hughes never really credits or even mentions RV in his public, in the ways that he publicizes this play, uh, which is interesting. Um, in this central letter, this is uh, a letter from Still to Hughes. Um, there was a little bit of creative tension there, um, or sometimes just logistical tension. Uh, Still is writing asking for an aria. Um, but I think I picked this letter because I think it's really cute, this little doodle at the bottom. It's unclear who drew that. Um, but I do think it's sort of emblematic of the fact that they had a sometimes tense, but like overall a very good working relationship um, that was years or decades in the making. Um, and then finally on the right, this is a letter in which uh, Still is accusing Hughes of using RV as a go-between. Um, so we can see that all three of them were very, very closely implicated in this play, um, in this opera's production. Okay, so one of the central themes, I think, that comes out of this project uh, when we're looking through the archives um, is that this opera was really trying to look to Haiti as this example of an illustrious Black Republic. Um, and so, and generally just allowing Black Americans to participate in the diaspora, almost as if it were their own history. Um, we've seen some issues with this, uh, including the exotification that sort of started off longa. Um, also the idea of parachuting in for research and then using some artistic license. Uh, but Hughes and Still were reasonably serious about the research components of this project and trying to uh, portray Haiti faithfully. Um, and so these are some of Hughes's research materials here that we're looking at. Um, these are collector's items. They're an assortment of postcards. Um, some of them have very prominent figures. So for example, on the right, we have Toussaint Louverture. Um, and then these are all sort of their postcards. It's interesting to note that were uh, produced um, on the anniversary of the French Revolution. So they are sort of mediated through a European lens as well. Um, and so that in a way can sort of structure um, the way that Haiti was presented in the opera. Um, but again, there was some genuine uh, hope for authenticity um, and still particularly was really anxious to have a Haitian dancer on staff um, to ensure that authenticity and to work with the ballet director. So eventually uh, Jean-Léon Dessine takes that role. And again, the idea that this is all for the race uh, really suffuses this collection. All three um, of its principal showrunners were very acutely aware um, of the meaning of this of this play to the diaspora and to Black Americans. Uh, were very aware that, you know, the reason that it had been sort of pushed aside by so many different theaters for so long was down to race. And so here we have uh, RV very explicitly saying, you know, outside of its value to us personally, it's going to be a milestone in race relations. This letter is from the eve of the production's premiere. Um, it, it's kind of sad because you can see from this letter that it seems like RV wasn't able to attend, um, which again is, you know, sort of coincides with her continual sidelining in a lot of the public discourse around this production. But again, the point to take away here is just that the importance of this play to Black Americans um, was very important. Uh, the stakes for this were thought to be very high. And so I think 
that's what makes the final production of Troubled Island um, so confusing to a lot of people today. Uh, these are some images of its final production um, in 1949. This comes from a magazine it's digitized in our archives um, called From Center, a magazine of the performing arts. Um, and so this is the fourth act here. And this is the thing that is most glaring to us today um, about Troubled Island. Uh, this is Robert Weed, um, who originated the role of Dessaline, and he's in blackface on opening night. Uh, the woman is Helena Bliss. She is also portraying a woman of color. She is also not a woman of color. Um, in general, none of the principal singers were black on opening day. Um, eventually, Lawrence Winters, who is a black singer, takes over the role from uh, Weed. Uh, Winters never receives the rave reviews that we did, um, which is another interesting thing to note. But in all, nine chorus members were black. Um, eight of the dancers were black. Uh, those are, you know, those are dancers that Destine took with him. Um, and so, and then there was Ida Johnson, who was a black singer, but she had a relatively minor role. Um, and so we kind of wonder, did this blackface somehow compromise the diasporic or the pro-black sentiment messaging to this opera? Um, at least for Phil, it did not. Uh, still, in his correspondence, it's very clear that he desperately wanted Weed to take this role. Um, and when he had the opportunity, in fact, to produce the play with sort of a, a skeleton crew from the WPA, um, where most of the actors and singers were white, I'm sorry, were black, he, he was not satisfied with their quality. Um, so that's very interesting to know. And I think it's also particularly ironic um, because this is a letter from 1943. Um, and we can see Phil is complaining that uh, many of the more prominent Black singers do not uh, perform works by Black composers. Um, and yet he had no problem being a Black composer who did not necessarily give work to Black singers. Um, so here we can see how some of the newspapers at the time reacted to this. Uh, this is the Chicago Defender. Um, the Defender was, Hughes was a correspondent. Um, for the defender. And so this is, you know, sort of a tempered reaction, I would say. Um, the defender was also a black paper, so it did feel the need to sort of address the elephant in the room, I guess. Um, it is interesting to note, we don't really know, or I didn't necessarily find anything in the archives about how Hughes felt about the blackface, um, which is possibly because he curated what he donated to the Beinecke. Um, but yeah, we can see here that the defender sort of, I don't think very convincingly tried to sidestep this. Um, not all reviews dismissed the blackface. Uh, Newsweek said, uh, quote, that, there's, that blackface was an obvious disadvantage. Um, you can also imagine that a lot of black opera singers were not super pleased. Um, and yet that's not necessarily what people talk about when they talk about Troubled Island. Uh, the main thing is that overall, this was very heavily racially coded in newspapers. Uh, it was it was trashed essentially by uh, reviewers. Um, on opening night, Troubled Island had 22 curtain calls. Um, and to read uh, some of the reviews that came out, you would never know it. Um, some of them were a little bit more blunt than others. Some of them tried to be punny. Nobody knows the trouble I've heard. Um, but essentially this opera, which was sort of meant to show Black ingenuity and persistence, um, both in terms of its subject matter and Dessaline, um, and also in terms of its three architects um, who were really trying to showcase their own uh, intellectual achievements and their own persistence and trying to produce this opera. Um, it was all sort of relegated to low art um, in the reviews. And that's something that is really discussed a lot even today. I want to turn to a news clip and tragically I do not speak French, but if someone wants to try and translate this and drop it in the chat, 
Um, this is from a Haitian newspaper. This is actually one of a couple of um, newspaper clips from Haiti that mentioned Troubled Island um, and that Hughes kept in his own files. Uh, and this is really interesting because one of the goals of Troubled Island was to establish a, a unity in diaspora um, and particularly to sort of promote linkages um, with Haiti specifically. So for example, you see Hughes and Still reaching out to um, Haitian publicists or government representatives, um, trying to support this in, in the international community. Um, and we can see that it did actually get some attention in Haiti. Um, and so maybe we can count that as some success. Um, generally speaking, Still and Hughes were trying to use their international networks, um, which often ran along professional and racial lines um, to promote their work abroad. So just generally using this as not only a way to depict, but also a vehicle for promoting diaspora, Black diaspora. Uh, so here we are again with this final image, which was the first image that we started off with. Uh, this is the Emperor of Haiti. Um, it was uh, run in Chicago in 1954. Um, and the Emperor of Haiti, again, is the play version rather than the opera version of this story that he's produced. Um, and that is because Troubled Island was never run again. Uh, it was run in 1949 and no one ever picked it up again. Um, so again, only versions of the play form like Emperor of Haiti were put on. Um, but it is interesting to note um, not only this sort of racial reckoning uh, that this opera sparked, um, but also the fact that these sort of heavily exotifying plays and operas about Haiti didn't necessarily continue to get produced um, in the age of black power uh, or in the age of like the civil rights proper. Um, and it's possible as well that uh, by the time that black showrunners were able to sort of produce their work um, more easily without jumping through so many ho hoops, uh, this look at a quote primitive um, Haiti that was really emphasized in uh, Wanga and Emperor of Haiti and Voodoo Macbeth and Troubled Island, uh, that just wasn't what people wanted anymore. Um, so Haiti as a concept gets taken forward in different ways. Um, and what's really remembered about Troubled Island is just the, the way that it was so affected by racialized reviews um, in the press. Uh, it is worth noting, and I wanna close with the fact that in 2009, the Schomburg put on portions of uh, Troubled Island for the first time in 60 years specifically for the 60 year anniversary. Uh, again, just portions of it. Um, but it's worth thinking about what the opera meant, uh, what it intended to do in the parameters of its own time and then what it means to us today.